Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to uh, the special presidential session. Um, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from King's College London uh, and I'm chairing today. Um, so I'm going to start off up here, although I will spend most of my time uh, down amongst you because I'm going to make sure that people do keep to time today. So I have my little cards uh, that will be stopping people. Uh, this really exciting event um, arose from a seminar that happened in London two years ago uh, that's part of the Centre uh, for Innovation in Teacher Education and Development, which is a, co a joint co-run centre from Teachers College, University of Columbia, and King's College London. Uh, and the aim of uh, our group, uh, and I, I do invite you to go and look at our new website, which came live last week, uh, is very much to look at this idea of innovation and to reclaim innovation uh, for uh, the teachers and the teacher educators uh, who work uh, and do so much fantastic uh, work within our education systems, not just uh, here in um, Canada, but in, uh, across the world. Um, so uh, what you're going to hear today uh, are um, a group who are internationally renowned scholars who are going to give you their take uh, on innovation and what innovation means. So we have six papers. Uh, here are the six papers. Uh, and they're going to have 15 uh, minutes each. Uh, and then we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Dorinda, who's going to be our discussant, uh, who's going to pull up the threads of what's actually happening to, uh, within these talks. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if I do my timing right, there'll be time at the end uh, for comments and questions. But we will be around at the end of the event uh, if people do want to talk with us more. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, start off. Uh, and our first paper today uh, is uh, Kelsey Doherty, who's going to uh, start us off with social justice teacher educators, what kind of knowing uh, is needed. Thank you. Hi. Um, unfortunately, Lynn Goodwin couldn't be here. Um, she wasn't feeling well this morning, so you're stuck with me. Um, but we uh, wrote this paper, I guess about a year ago, um, looking at what kind of knowing is needed for social justice in, um, for teacher educators. Um, so we were looking at two issues. Uh, the first being uh, the quality and effectiveness of teacher education, which largely depends on competence and expertise of teacher educa educators. Uh, it's commonly understood that, or known, uh, that teacher education and teacher educators are important, but at the same time, teacher ed uh, qualifications are minimally discussed, and formal preparation for those who instruct teachers is often absent. Um, so it's important, but we're not talking about it. And then also the issue of educating teachers for diverse classrooms needs to be addressed urgently um, in our changing social context, increasing amounts of immigrant, refugee, and vulnerable youth. Uh, it's very important that we, we know how to teach those students in our classroom. Um, but what this means and how it can be enacted remains unclear. And what we um, assumed going in and then also found to be true, what, was that um, the rhetoric around social justice and teacher education is more robust than uh, the actual practice of doing it. Um, so, if you cannot teach what you do not know, um, what do teacher educators need to know and do in order to move from espousing to enacting social justice in their teaching uh, and teaching educating, teacher educating practice? Um, so in this study, we looked at five knowledge domains that were previously developed by Lynn and um, used those as lenses to analyze scholarly literature that speaks to international teacher ed for social justice. Um, these domains, uh, the first is personal, uh, where their beliefs about students, schooling, teachers, and teaching, and these are based on past experiences and personal attitudes. So, what do our student teachers, pre-service teachers, bring with them into the classroom? What are they already thinking about? Um, a contextual knowledge is not only classroom and family communities, but it's also looking at that as situated within a larger political, historical, institutional, and cultural context. Um, it's really understanding where all of this is happening. 
Um, pedagogical knowledge is not just how-to strategies. Uh, it's also the ability to observe and analyze the situation, uh, really recognize what your students are bringing and also what they need, uh, and then developing appropriately responsive practices and not just picking something out of a hat. Um, sociological uh, knowledge is understanding really that we have a complicated and diverse world and it is growing ever more inter interdependent at the same time that it is increasingly diverse diversifying. Um, so how are we going to answer to and respect that diversity in our classrooms? And then lastly is the social knowledge, uh, which is an ability to participate in and lead democratic and cooperative groups. And teachers need to be able to do that um, if we are going to create classroom settings where cooperation, fairness, mutuality, and equality are norms. So that's the framework that we use to see what kind of literature is being written about teacher educators and social justice. Uh, so in our data, we looked at three journals, uh, highly ranked, widely read, and well-respected. We looked at the Journal of Teacher Education in the United States, uh, the Journal of Education for Teaching in the United Kingdom, and the Australian Journal of Teacher Education, just to kind of get a broad sense of what people are writing about um, internationally. Uh, we looked at the years 2010 through 2016 uh, because that kept it manageable, um, but also that was enough of a base that we could actually understand like, okay, well, what are people actually writing about? This is a credible study because we looked at enough data. Um, and so ultimately, uh, there were nearly 1,800 articles that were potential, had potential to be in this study. Um, as we were narrowing the articles, uh, we were looking specifically for pre-service prep for social justice articles. Um, and we were reading titles, abstracts, keywords, what do we need, what is, what is indicating that there might be something more in this article. And we, we tried to be very inclusive um, and pretty generous initially with thinking of what are the articles that we want to include. Um, so we looked for social justice, any, any mention of increasing diversity, educational equity, those were the articles that we read um, completely. We looked at 2010 and 2011, it says together, but it it was together, but also independently. Uh, we looked at each of these years and independently decided which articles were going to fit and um, came to an agreement. And ultimately, we had 76 articles that we reviewed. And uh, we were looking really at what are the authors say themselves saying about uh, their work. What, is, what, what are they saying are their main ideas, their goals, their purposes? Um, what are they putting in headings? What are their conclusions? What are their key points? Um, to really allow us to clarify and further operationalize our domains so that we really understood what we were talking about, but also we were honoring what the, the original researchers had to say about their work. And we looked at article type what kinds of articles there were. Uh, there were overwhelmingly uh, empirical articles. Um, so there is an emphasis on research in these journals, but there's also a lack of emphasis on research about preparing social justice teachers. As uh, the 76 articles we ended up with were just 4% of that original 1800. So we're talking about it, but we're not then actually writing about it. Um, when we were looking at the content of what these articles are about, we found that generally they're talking about diverse learners in general, um, rather than looking at in terms of specific racial or cultural groups, specific needs, specific issues or considerations, um, just really addressing things broadly, which is a good first step. And then finally, our knowledge domains. Um, you can see, well, maybe you can't because the words are very small, but um, the, the domain that was most, like, by far, 
emphasized was personal knowledge and um, what student teachers and pre-service teachers are bringing to their teacher preparation programs. Um, so most of the research in the field is uh, looking at understanding the beliefs of pre-service teachers. And more often than not, they were focused on the mismatch of increasingly diverse student bodies and the homogenous teaching forces. So nothing really new or shocking. Um, and most researchers were looking at the beliefs of their own students through surveys, interviews, and analysis of work samples, especially like um, reflection essays and other things that student teachers had produced. Uh, so overall, we um, developed some insights regarding social justice in teacher education, and as we suspected, um, the rhetoric is a lot stronger than social justice in teacher education practice. Um, uh, oftentimes, these studies were in single courses, so one professor would be doing this kind of work with one group of students. It was not like across the program. It wasn't multiple courses. It was a one-time thing and then it was done. Um, and there were continuous restarts at step one. So the studies aren't building. Everyone's kind of asking the same initial questions and doing similar studies just with different groups of students. Um, and therefore they're finding similar things, but we're not moving past that. And then uh, the isolated and discontinuous small-scale backyard studies, um, they're really looking at their own students and everything is very um, contextual for their situation. And uh, most of the authors framed helping future teachers examine and alter their views about diversity as a fundamental problem of teacher preparation. And so they were invested in discerning the impact of an intervention or experience on shifting, expanding, or modifying the thinking of their teacher candidates. The intervention or experience was mostly contained within one course uh, or a specific program or a specific sociocultural or geographic location. And the conclusion of most studies was that the intervention or activity was successful in helping uh, pre-service teachers develop greater cultural understanding, become more socially aware of their implicit biases, and reduce deficit thinking. Um, however, they offered few illustrations of specific teacher education practices uh, reflective of the field as a whole, um, where we can actually replicate these things in our, our own context. Uh, so implications would be uh, accidental profession no more. Um, teacher educators are obviously in need of formal preparation and we need to really think um, critically about what kind of preparation that looks like um, because there's a need for social justice, um, teacher preparation, and if we are going to prepare teachers for the classroom to do social justice, then we as teacher educators also need to know um, what we're doing. Um, we need collective research, heftier studies. Um, the studies that we reviewed, again, were small scale, short term, uh, focused on very individual courses and experiences. And if we could link these studies across context, um, countries and disciplinary boundaries, lots of people are talking about this but they're doing it kind of in silos. And what could, what could we accomplish if we work together? Um, how could we make this more impactful so that we're actually progressing forward? And then uh, finally, social justice thinking and doing. Um, we often, we found a lot of our articles in uh, special issues um, of journals and social justice isn't a special issue. It should be a, a baseline criterion um, for teacher preparation. Um, so we should be thinking about how are we creating social justice programs and not just courses. Um, so really thinking much more broadly and actually doing more of the work that uh, we're talking about, but not necessarily doing. So thank you.
Hello, um, I'm Keith Turvey from uh, University of Brighton in the southeast coast uh, in England. And the um, title of my talk is Humanizing as Innovation in a Cold Climate of So-Called Evidence-Based Teacher Education. Um, it's a conceptual paper um, where I wanted to try and problematize our, uh, our, our kind of the, the approach to evidence that is, that is predominant and that, that our student teachers are often uh, kind of exposed to, particularly through social media, um, but also the, uh, the dominant sort of uh, approaches in, in, to research in teacher education. And I apologize, uh, usually when I'm in a rush, I become more polemic than academic, but uh, let's have a go, 15 minutes. Um, to start off, just trying to kind of define what I mean by sort of humanizing research evidence, but also innovation. Um, I come from a sort of uh, educational technology research background where there's been a lot of techno-determinist kind of approaches to innovation that focus very much on change. So, you know, if we think of kind of Sternberg's eight, eight sort of uh, his taxonomy, taxonomy of, of innovation, focuses very much on the change. What I'm really interested in is, is this, this concept of being able to innovate in any context. I want my teachers to be able to be responsive and sustaining of innovation and education and learning in across a range of diverse contexts. So I think we've become too transfixed on innovation as change for change's sake. And that's something that particularly kind of dominates the technology, um, research, educational technology research uh, area. So what do I mean by humanizing and dehumanizing? Um, evidence that humanizes, uh, that, that dehumanizes, I think is increasingly becoming meaningless um, and unusable. It lacks the provenance, and I'm gonna keep coming back to this word, provenance, pedagogical provenance, professional provenance, what do we mean by that? Um, that's capable of sustaining learning and also teacher development within and across diverse contexts. So meaningful and humanizing evidence for me is evidence that is not just meaningful for the teachers who are utilizing it, making use of it, but also meaningful for those in the context within which they might be innovating. Some teachers would claim that, for example, randomized control trials might be meaningful to them. But actually, how meaningful is the intervention based upon the evidence that they're using to the communities, the learners, and the individuals with whom they're working with. How meaningful and appropriate does it sustain their learning? So meaningful humanizing in this context for me is, is evidence that's based upon a rich provenance, it's granular detail um, that's, that actually is responsive and able to sustain not only teacher teachers learning, but also their students in meaningful ways to them. And I just want to kind of have a look at some of the kind of evidence bases that are being used quite increasingly in teacher education, in teachers. There's, a, there's quite a sort of econ econometric, um, if you like, imperative driving much research evidence. In, in England particularly, there's much use made of the, the Education Endowment Fund teacher toolkit which is often based on meta-analysis. So in technology, so if we look at Hassler and uh, Hassler tells meta-analysis of RCTs focusing on the, the introduction of iPads into schools, you know, they found looking predominantly at ad hoc outcomes, uh, 16 positive impact on attainment, five no difference, and two negative impact on attainment. But really significantly, uh, can quite often get lost, I think, a large proportion of the identified research offered limited or no details of the activities that learners engaged in, which I find pretty stunning, actually. The actual kind of qualitative nature of these interventions with iPads, it just seems to me like they might have just as well dropped them off in the classroom and come back later. But, but, it's, but it's, I think it's troubling that increasingly the evidence base that teachers are being given to draw on in such things as teacher toolkits is essentially lacking in any kind of qualitative, um, meaningful data that might be useful. 
as Marilyn Cochrane Smith has, has kind of made quite clear, the, the, the discourse of econome econometrics has really pervaded all aspects of, of education and teacher education. So the problem with econometrics is that it's, it's basically biased towards populations, um, but we're dealing with communities, individuals, who come with their own cultural context, historical context and backgrounds, which quite often epidemiological research is not responsive to, um, I'd argue. And with my own student teachers, um, you know, if there's any doubt about the pervasiveness of this, uh, 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 of this, this discourse of econometrics, quite often my student teachers come back into university having been uh, in schools for one term, and this, this, is, this is often the way that they start to talk about groups of children in their class. Met, met minus, met plus, on track to achieve below expected, highers, lowers. Whether they're highers, lowers, on track to achieve, met, minus, etc. for me this is, a, uh, this is a deficit discourse. This is a discourse of putting children into categories and pretty much leaving them there without really kind of responding to, well, what do we, you know, who, who are these children? What is their cultural context? What is their background? What meaning are they making of the, of the activities and the, uh, uh, that we're engaging with here? Also, uh, something to, uh, that I'm concerned about is, that is if you like, uh, the, the sort of the other imperative at the moment, that I'd, I'd say this is the next kind of, if you like, uh, technologically determinist innovation that we're kind of faced, which is the kind of rise in datification, how easy it is, increasingly easy to collect data um, on teachers. I was just reading this morning um, about a, an initiative in China with cameras on the walls that look at a room like this and put squares around faces and have the algorithms to actually analyze, uh, you know, engaged, disengaged, etc. You know, really how useful is this? Is it a distraction? Cope and Calancis argue that increasing datification means that increasingly uh, professionals are working in transformed environments. And they argue that, that actually New professionals need, need new pedagogical sensibilities. For me, I think there's a little bit of naivety here about the potential of datification um, and possibly and the dangers in terms of its potential to distract and also to kind of ride fairly roughshod over kind of the ethical and moral kind of underpinning of our work as educators and teachers. So I'm interested in data and evidence that actually provides pedagogical provenance. Because um, what I see is potentially pedagogical paralysis. If we go back to Hasseretel's study, there's nothing there really that really helps a teacher to think about how they might use an iPad and, and the kind of intrinsic value that that might have in de developing children's digital literacies, their understanding of networks and social media. So pedagogical uh, provenance for me is the potential data to afford meaningful application use in praxis. And um, my colleague and I, uh, Norbert Packler, uh, did a, a review of educational technology and, you know, the, in terms of the education endowment uh, toolkit in the UK that's often used with teachers, which just simply raises more questions. But also I think um, a lot of the way that evidence is gathered and used um, has what Parkhurst, Justin Parkhurst, calls technical and issue bias built into it in the sense that um, it kind of, often in the way it's used, can other alternative forms of data sources that are really important if we're to really um, think about the impact that our pedagogies have on issues of social justice um, and equity. So... Parkhurst argues that uh, you know, quite often these are just insufficient basis for policy decisions, but more often than not, policy uh, is, is interested in this kind of evidence. So, perfect. Narrative. 
I'm going to just put in the caveat here that I, I am not suggesting that narrative uh, and narration uh, is a panacea, but I'm going to leave that bit of my paper out um, because I have five minutes left. So the desire to understand and explain a natural human instincts to story and, and narrative is a powerful uh, research tool. Um, because it's argued that it offers um, the potential to recognize the distinctive and diverse nature of lived experience. But also, if we're interested in developing student teachers and teachers um, as, as worthy witnesses and building relationships of care, dignity, and dialogical consciousness raising, then I think narrative is a fundamental tool. And I'm just going to finish with an example, um, which you can make up your own mind about, uh, you know, in terms of whether this is a humanizing, culturally sustaining innovation. On my course, we use blogging a lot uh, with student teachers to try and get them to explore that liminal space between uh, being in university and being in school and the kinds of experiences they have so they can synthesize theory and practice. So let's have a look at some thin evidence. Um, here's a blog on inclusion and diversity. Um, we notice straight away that it, you know, it has more page views um, and unique page views. But also, interestingly, uh, more people stayed longer on this, this page. You know, it's pretty thin, I think, for the meaningless, meaningless evidence in, in one sense. But if we look at behind this blog post, we come to Omar's blog. Omar is a deaf student who was studying a PGC primary uh, education course and experienced a lot of obstacles um, that we were trying to sort of uh, to remove, to actually enable um, Omar to be successful because he has a great deal to offer. One of the things that you know, particularly he had to offer was sharing his experience as a deaf student, as a deaf child, recalling his experiences. When I was a child, no one wanted to play with me because I always had communication support worker with me. Other children had a stigma against having adults around and they generally left me alone. The longer page views on Omar's blog posts were simply about the provenance, the real provenance of Omar's experience as a deaf student within different learning contexts, training to become a teacher, learning himself. Um, so what we're looking at here is curriculum and pedagogy as narration, not prescription. Um, when we have knowing as storying is valued, and promoted and represented. Narratives, I think, provide the, the space for pedagogic moments like, like Omar's, Omar's moment there. Um, and their hopes and aspirations, and ultimately an intentional, mentored construction of knowledge. So all of the student teachers on, within that group were able to benefit from Omar's unique perspective there in a really positive way. So finally, I think we need to actively and equitably engage and listen to the voices of those enacting innovation, focusing on context, much more focus. We need to question critically the nature of evidence that our student teachers are drawing upon and question that. We need to shift away from determinist, econometric or technological imperatives towards innovation, um, much more towards what I would call hum humanizing imperatives for innovation. Thank you. in Melbourne, Australia, although I am originally from Toronto. And I'm, um, I'm presenting today on behalf of myself and my colleague Bruce Burnett from Australian Catholic University in Australia, and he couldn't make it all the way to Canada this year. So I'm going to be talking today about the um, NETDS program, the National Exceptional Teaching for Disadvantaged Schools program, which has been running in Australia now for 
10 years. And I think that one of the things I'm going to do today is not only just tell you about the program, but also critique it a little bit along the way. Because if we're talking about uh, innovation, then we mustn't become complacent. And we mustn't talk about um, what works. And really, we should avoid talking about um, silver bullets that seem to offer solutions to perennial and changing um, issues. Uh, so one of the things I think I'll begin by saying is that if we were to start now, we would never have called it the Exceptional Teaching for Disadvantaged Schools program because discourses change. So we've talked a lot about this over time, but it's quite a complicated one, so I don't have much time to talk about this, but we talk all the time uh, uh, about it with our pre-service teachers, teachers, principals, and other stakeholders all of whom offer different language and discourse around what we can call this program. Um, for instance, as many of you would know, in the US, you often talk about urban education, but it's not really language that works all that well in the Australian context, where a lot of our uh, poverty and disadvantage is, in fact, rural or remote. Um, principals would like us to talk about equity-focused schools, but of course, many of the schools aren't equity-focused in reality. So I want to begin by kind of critiquing the name of our own program and saying that we wouldn't have called that anymore. These days, we tend to talk about uh, high-poverty schools, but that also, in some ways, is inadequate. So I say that right up front. Um, I'll talk a little bit, though, today about the nature of the program, a critique of the program, and what I am now starting at the Trobe University, which I think is the extension of the program in some ways. Uh, when we began the NETDS program, in many ways it was for selfish reasons. We were sociologists in a faculty of education. We saw our sociology subjects um, being reduced. There were almost none left in our faculty at a certain stage. Um, we were concerned that we saw our very best, most socially justice-oriented pre-service teachers kind of get absorbed into the system and get cherry-picked, in fact, by um, private and independent and what in Australia we call leafy green schools by the time they graduated. So some of the ones we thought were just the most amazing of our students in first year when they were doing you know, indigenous education subjects or sociology subjects ended up teaching in the private schools. I'll show you a little bit of data on that later. Um, but this depressed us. And we also, for very selfish reasons, thought if we could just hive off those amazing pre-service teachers and give them what we thought was a great equity-oriented teacher education program, um, we'd get to the work with the students we wanted to work with most. You know, it was, and at the time, we had this great um, uh, culture within our faculty uh, that, uh, where we were given permission to do so. Uh, one of the things that I'll critique a little bit later on is that this kind of program is a little bit expensive because, in fact, we spent so much more time in schools, so much more time with our pre-service teachers reflecting, um, debriefing, et cetera, that um, that puts these programs, I think, at risk in general. Um, but we knew that there was high teacher turnover, you know, we knew all the things everybody else knows, that there's high teacher turnover in low SES schools, um, that teachers don't feel prepared to teach in them, uh, that they come to teaching, into teaching with deficit perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, and that they aren't themselves a culturally diverse group. So in some ways, the program itself was reasonably simple. We worked very hard at the beginning, and, we were, and then we felt lucky that we had uh, to develop the program in a way that made it not difficult to run. So the way it worked was that we would identify Oh, uh, sorry, I'm going to critique that in a moment also. We would identify, um, because that's not in fact quite accurate. That's not in fact what happened. It came though from the principal, directly from principals of high poverty schools saying, um, don't send us, you know, people, you're, don't send us your missionaries is actually what they said to us. Can you send us some great math teachers? Because actually, we had one principal tell us, um, you know, the high expectations discourse where you say any teacher can be a rocket scientist, any teacher can be a doctor, is just lying to teachers, to students, unless in fact they get some chemistry and physics and science and things along the way. Um, because, be, so they wanted um, 
uh, high achieving teachers. Along the way, we critiqued that, we changed our criteria, but high academic achievement was always one of our criteria. One of our criteria, and we've had to work really hard at um, resisting criticism of that because that didn't mean we excluded caring, socially just, culturally diverse teachers. Those assumptions in themselves, I think, were deficit that we wouldn't find um, participants who were both uh, you know, teachers of color plus from low SES backgrounds themselves plus had a sense of social justice and also were doing well academically. So um, that was one criteria. We brought them together as a cohort and community. It's on cohort 10 now because we've been running 10 years. Um, taught them a social justice curriculum in all sorts of ways. Um, they did all of their practicum placements in high poverty schools or low SAS schools. And then we found ourselves increasingly drawn into the employment cycle whereby after a certain time when we proved ourselves, um, uh, principals started calling us up saying, got any of yours, I'm hiring. So that's kind of how it worked. I emphasize this here, grade point average was only ever one of the selection criteria but it is one of the selection criteria. We worked hard so that there were no bribes or rewards for being part of this program. They didn't get extra credit. They did it because they were passionate about it. Um, if it didn't work out in every year, there were one or two who either weren't resilient enough or weren't as committed as they thought they were or weren't suited. They went straight back into their regular teacher ed program. There was no loss to them or to us or to anyone. Uh, we focused, of course, on social inclusion. Uh, they did all of their uh, prac in a low SES setting. Uh, I would say probably that the, uh, one of the main reasons it has been successful is because of the community of practice. NET teachers, NETDS teachers know each other, they hang out. We've still got a really active Facebook site. Uh, we, we often had calls at midnight, you know, from, from teachers trying to work something out. Um, one of my teachers is here at AERA this year doing her PhD now, an amazing PhD now. Another one is doing, several others are doing their PhDs as well. It's a big community. I'll just show you a tiny little bit of that data, and I, I won't emphasize it because I probably don't have that much time left, but the turnaround in terms of where teachers got jobs was immediate. So before we started the program, 65% of the top graduating teachers at at my old university ended up in private schools. They were just snapped up. They got lost into the system immediately because we worked so much together um, that 82% of them, the, next, the very first year, ended up in low SES schools. And that has been consistent all along. And I feel quite proud to say almost all of them, 85%, I think it's 84% of them, are still after 10 years working in low SES schools. So we're pretty proud of that, what we think is systemic change. And the Australian Research Council Engagement and Innovation uh, case studies have just come out and we were ranked quite highly in terms of engagement and innovation. Um, then at some point, because we had track record, we started to get noticed and it was only then that we got external funding um, and moved into other universities. And now we're running in, in, in uh, eight universities across the country. But in my own uh, in self-critique and in working out what the issues are for this kind of program, um, it very much like it does in schools depended on the university leadership. Um, so in fact, uh, we began the, what we used to call the flagship program, which was at the first university it started in, um, is no longer running the program. So there are two issues of critique I would offer there. One is that you have to get support from leadership in order to run this kind of a program. And the other one is a lesson I myself is, have learned, and that is that the, um, the program itself was 
for a very long time, largely the Bruce and Joe show. <laughs> it was me and my colleague working overtime, you know? So actually it made it unsustainable. So if I could say something about the sustainable sustainability of social justice programs is it has to be a whole of school endeavor. It's just got to be. Otherwise, you know, we're all going to, we're all going to die one day. <laughs> Isn't that the song? So um, we've got to kind of keep that in mind. All along, there were tensions with the program and rather than call them tensions, maybe I should talk about um, challenges, but really they were tensions. We were always pulled into the wider debates about entry into initial teacher education, uh, privatizing initial teacher education, how are you different from Teach for Australia. We have consistently had to prove, our, um, prove ourselves um, to critique. Um, the whole debate around quality teaching and the kind of thing that we've already heard from two speakers today um, and, and Keith was talking about um, the quality teaching debates and how do you prove your impact um, and pressures on us all along to prove that our teachers would, that we would be able to see um, increased uh, academic achievement amongst the future teachers of our graduates um, we put a lot of work. We got some funding one year and hired um, statisticians and tried to work out some methodologies around how you could do that. It's so flawed to pretend that your, te that your teachers can be measured on their future students' outcomes. Um, but it's so grounded in what people will ask you to do if you kind of... So I think those new... The conversations we're having around proving impact are just fundamental. Uh, sustainability I've already talked about and of course you know teacher ed changes all the time so every time there's a new policy around teacher ed um, you really need to be quite adaptable and uh, and and hold your ground because uh, it's such a crowded curriculum everywhere anyway and such um, a highly regulated uh, field that is quite easy for social justice to disappear from us all together, much less to be given the luxury time to work with small groups of students. Um, so now I'm just going to end by talking about what I think is the new, how much time have I got left? Okay, so the new iteration, which is something that at La Trobe University we're calling the Nexus program, and I am actually very excited about. So I know a lot about this kind of work, but there were things always along the way that I thought could be better. And one of the things is about community engagement. That's kind of, um, uh, I don't think teacher education in general has ever done like community engagement, and I'm talking about working within the communities in which the teachers are teaching very well. For instance, I know that we, many of us graduate teachers who have actually never even met a family, um, except for maybe at a parent-teacher night when really most of the middle class families come anyway, um, or possibly making a phone call home. But really getting, uh, working with community is an issue of changing uh, power imbalances uh, in the system in general. Um, so. We're working really um, uh, closely on trying to develop what we hope will be a genuinely community-engaged teacher education program, working with rather than acting on, and that will mean uh, recruiting pre-service teachers from the community themselves, uh, working mostly in schools on school sites to offer teacher education, um, uh, and, um, you know, and all of the social inclusion still at its core. So I think that, so that, all, I think that's a bit of a snapshot of what we're doing. I'll let you do it because I'm not used, I'm only used yeah. to Max. I am too. We'll figure this out. All right. Um, good morning. I'm uh, Michael Dominguez from San Diego State University. And I first wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm really pleased to be here today on traditional territory of many nations, including the uh, Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, uh, the Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. Um, and so today, what I'm going to be talking about is decolonial innovation in teacher education. And what that word 
decolonial like means because just a quick cursory search of social media will show you that it's becoming increasingly trendy and just like many other words that we start to use in social justice education starting to become increasingly devoid of meaning and so what it like then continuing on to think about like what it might mean to engage in praxis beyond what we would call the colonial zero point and to begin explaining that concept I actually want to just share an image that's going to seem a little bit random here and what we're looking at is an episode from the Latin American comic Mafalda, which depicts a young girl as she makes sense of her sociopolitical and sociocultural world. And one particular fascination Mafalda has is her place in the global south and what this means for her knowledge and her identity. And so here, uh, it is in Spanish, Mafalda speaks with a classmate who has inverted the world map. And she asks, why has he reversed it? His reply, however, is to question the assumption, the zero point of white coloniality itself and push Mafalda to consider, given that the world exists in space and that up and down distinctions above and below, literally the way we orient the, and view and operate in our world are arbitrary. And if we together step back from that for a moment, then the reality dawns on us that that map and so much of our world and lives just isn't arbitrary, but it necessarily positions Europe and the Western world top and center, drawn disproportionately larger and oversized in many projections. It's a bit simplistic, but the point as we speak here today about teacher education is simply to raise the question of how so much of our world, our lives, our pedagogies, and the pedagogies we teach our educators are, intentionally or not, operating just like that world map, oriented through a hubristic lens of colonial assumption, as the legacies and Eurocentric myopia of colonization linger in our everyday lives, shaping our institutions and leaving them ill-suited to serve our historically marginalized students. Because even though the de jure systems of colonization and colonialism may have been rolled back and ostensibly lifted, coloniality as a de facto reality has persisted and thrived in our world. As Maldonado Torres notes, it's the longstanding patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. It's alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of self, and so many other aspects of our modern experience. And recognizing and acknowledging this distinction between coloniality and colonialism is imperative. For while colonialism was overt and tangible, coloniality is all of that. Now, perhaps more than ever, we can, worldwide, with a bit more time, name countless tangible examples of neocolonialism and Eurocentric hegemony, but it's also epistemic. Coloniality is psychic. It's spiritual in its oppression. Coloniality anchors us to an epistemic zero point, an ideology, a logic that ensures that our sociopolitical and sociocultural worlds, our norms, our institutions, our, the, what we value and see as important in schooling, teaching, and learning, they begin and end with the discourses of whiteness and Eurocentrism. In essence, Eurocentric knowledge warps our perspective, validating its own logic and hubris by encouraging the ongoing subjugation, devaluation, and denial of the wisdoms, knowledges, insights, contributions, and experiences of the global south. And while this can seem abstract and distant, it's a vague theoretical term, coloniality, right? It shouldn't, because coloniality, the zero point, and colonial hubris, they are alive and well in teacher education in the most practical and grounded of ways. We can see coloniality in the way pedagogical content and curricular theory remains dominated by Eurocentric literatures and thinking, the way even our culturally responsive pedagogies fail to center, sustain, or revitalize the culture of communities of color. It's alive in the way we still avoid meaningfully engaging with race in teacher education, and as folks have noted, relegate engagement with questions of justice to inoculation courses once in a uh, experience. It's alive in the way our diverse field experiences fail to disrupt colonial arrangements of knowledge and hierarchical dy power dynamics, and in the way covering demands narrow how diversity is welcomed in institutions, while their constraints simultaneously provide educators with white intellectual alibis to displace their own culpability. And this coloniality has flourished even amidst our discourses of multiculturalism, equity, and social justice. For the reality is that we've fallen short of troubling the zero point of preparing our educators to question what counts as knowledge, as success, as valued culture, even within conversations of social justice. Because we've deployed those discourses themselves within colonial frames, as even our critical pedagogies, broadly speaking, have remained epistemically obedient to that colonial zero point. 
We failed to authentically honor the lived material and effective realities of historically marginalized communities. And in so doing, we've bound ourselves and our outcomes to the lingering ways that society, neoliberalism, and culture position marginalized and post-colonial communities as subordinate, striving towards mimicry of impossible standards in an effective terrain in which historically marginalized youth will always be, as Homibada says, always the same but not quite, always the same but not white. And nor should they be. Because as Fanon reminds us, challenging the colonial world is not meant to be a, a rational confrontation of viewpoints. It's not a discourse on the universal, but an impassioned claim by the colonized that their world is fundamentally different. And that perhaps is the core here, that we've not heard that cry or recognized that the historically marginalized youth and communities who we are meant to serve experience and know the world in profoundly different effective ways. And what we have been left with is the reality of ontological distance, the vast effective terrain emerging from coloniality between the practices, knowledges, and goals that are recognized in schools and beyond as valid and normative on one hand, and an evolving multitude of others deeply rooted in community histories and present and vivid in the lives of youth of color on the other. Disrupting coloniality then requires that we work to close the ontological distance between our educators and our, their students. But so long as we cling to the colonial zero point in our epistemic ontological practice, these distances will persist. And when they persist, when ontological distance persists, change, equity, diversity, social justice will continue to be depleted of meaning as they echo more and more hollow each year, and our teachers will not be the types of people who can do the pedagogies that we know that youth need. But I don't want to dwell on doom and gloom here because there's always, there's always hope and possibility. I've got two computers open and I'm clicking the wrong things. <laughs> All right. Um, there's always hope and possibility here. And the reality is we have already a robust repertoire of generative practice to build from. And we largely know what we want teachers to be able to do. Rather, the challenge should be how we might reorient, remediate these practices to position our educators to be the types of people who can do that work. The challenge of innovation we face then is not pragmatic, but epistemic and effective shifting the colonial ways we and our novices think the world and remediating who our educators and we are in relation to the subaltern other, closing those ontological distances. By preparing educators to rec recognize the impacts of coloniality, both tangible and effective, dramatic and mundane on the way the world is experienced. And so if we focus on what it might mean in our praxis to close ontological distance, then we might approach a teacher education paradigm that, rather than acceding to epistemic obedience and the colonial zero point, encourages generative discomfort and epistemic disobedience, focusing for once on the knower, the historically marginalized youth, and not the colonial known, to actively seek to honor, to understand, to learn, to explore, to appreciate the center, and to sustain the languages, practices, culture, and wisdom of historically marginalized youth. So what does this look like? Well, I don't think we could ever point to any one way that decolonial practice might look because, frankly, the goal here is to decolonize all of our practices. Uh, the point is that we should be decolonizing everything that we do, rather, right? But decolonizing practices should seek to cultivate what I'll call pedag pedagogical imaginaries, drawing from Perez, where differential politics and social dilemmas can be negotiated, and a community can enter epistemically uncomfortable space and ask hard questions of themselves to leverage epistemologies and confront, disrupt, and mediate the ways in which coloniality lives and lingers in schools and in the material and effective lives of historically marginalized youth. To that end, I want to offer just a little uh, short um, example of what maybe this might look like. What we're going to watch here is a little uh, quick exercise of Teatro del Parmito, where a variety of teacher candidates, uh, pre-service teachers, were working to sort of role play an experience that might come up. And just like I've mentioned, here we set this up working with uh, a literature text that they were working on, but setting it up so that it would necessarily lead them to hard questions. And so um, what we see here is two educators uh, who are acting as students had begun a heated argument before we begin, so they couldn't show the whole thing, too much time, um, right? Acting as students, they'd begun a heated argument about a di dismissive and misogynistic comment one of them had made related to an sexual assault as it arose in a text that they were reading. After an attempt at mediating this classroom moment, we join the conversation as Kirsten, acting as the teacher, pauses the conversation to engage the group in sense making and problem solving over how to handle such a moment. And then I'm pausing from Tiatra. This is really hard for me because this is something that's really personal. 
And so this is like really good that I'm doing this right now. But I want to strangle you. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm trying to work through right now is I have to pause it because I don't know. I'm trying to make it so everyone feels comfortable. But in reality, I want to be like, yeah, Josie, like, freaking go. <laughs> and, and I want to say, like, you know, I worked on a right price crisis hotline. My sister was raped. Like, I know many people who were. Like, I want to, like, say all that, but I don't want to make your person like you. But, like, yeah, you're yeah, acting just uncomfortable, exactly. you know? I think, I think it's a good point to, like, reach out form formally at that point. You know, get a little personal. And, you know, and express that, you know, there's different places where we're all coming from here. This is the way I see it, maybe in an educated space. Yeah, those conversations that are really going to create change, they're going to be hard. And there's going to be feelings that are going to be mixed up. That, and nothing's ever going to be clean, because there's nothing that's completely clean. But the way I see it, it's okay for you to get your emotions involved as well, because that's part of learning. And I think that's what it's like so valuable in is that it's not ignoring the feelings that we're all bringing in, but rather cherishing them and using it as a tool for us to move forward. And, and I think that also comes back into this idea of becoming vulnerable ourselves. That's kind of hard though, though, because like growing up, we never saw that. No. But so I mean, like, I, yeah, I feel like you're saying, like, you know, it's easier said than done. That can be liberating for our students to see that. Like, see, like, you can be emotional, you can demonstrate that and still be in this position where you're helping others and where you're serving others and, and like collectively learning from each other, like my homie said, sometimes they do need almost a little bit of validation for their feelings. And sometimes we as educators can provide that. So what I hope we're seeing there, this is obviously just a small example, but that this is both a moment where we are talking about questions of praxis, of how to do something in a classroom, but also who to be and how to be with students to close those ontological distances that exist between what they might be experiencing and the colonial frames that teachers are often meant to work through as they go through crap like the EdTPA, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so this is a telling example. As the students here, they engage in epistemic disobedience. They're considering not just what would be most pragmatic, how to get through the situation as quickly and cleanly as possible, but how we value what students are saying and bringing, how they're feeling and thinking, and how we ourselves might lead, not with colonial rationality and reason, but vulnerability. Pedagogical imaginaries then help us dig into and ask this vital question. What is it we are decolonizing from? And grow our pedagogical selves guided by those answers. And so I want to end here with more Mafalda. Here, her classmate finds himself shocked and then quizzical as he's turned disorientingly right side up. And it's revealed that this has occurred because Mafalda, smiling, has inverted the globe, recentering knowledge to align with her perspective, her ontology, her practices, and her world. Latin America, the global south, has risen into ascendancy. In a very literal way, this is the decolonial turn. Because decolonization is necessarily jarring. It should leave us unsteady. A pedagogy that requires discomfort, but that in our hyper-diverse world must be the goal, ensuring that we work to close the ontological distance uh, between the educators we prepare and the students they will teach. And that means that we need to be asking ourselves some profoundly hard questions, including whether we center Global South thinking, or have we just had them read one article on culturally responsive pedagogy, maybe chapter two from Paulo Freire, right? Where are Fanon? Baba, Mignolo, Spivak, Anzaldúa in our praxis. And if our impulse is to think of those texts as too challenging for educators, what does that say about our relationship to the ontologies, the knowledge traditions that reflect the experiences and ways of being of our historically marginalized youth? Because if we ourselves are not centering, let alone robustly engaging with race, with questions of difference, with global South thinking, epistemologies, and ontological frameworks in our own thought, work, and praxis, how can we ever expect our novice and practicing teachers to do so in their classrooms? My point here is that this decolonial imperative I've tried to lay out is not, or at least should, should not be, just a buzzword. Right? We as teacher educators have our own ontological distances to face, our own colonial assumptions and zero points to uproot. If we want to produce liberatory teachers, if we want to confront the ongoing malignancies of coloniality, then those hard questions need to begin with ourselves. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Susan Giroux. 
And the title of our paper is Remediating Knowledge Infrastructures, a Site for Innovation in Teacher Education. Since my computer is over here, I'm just going to shout from like moving over here. Okay. That's okay. I can, I can, I can handle this. All right. So we wrote this paper as a way to develop a shared analytic framework for designing and analyzing our distinct and contextually specific approaches to designing responsible and social justice oriented innovations in teacher education. So each of us is engaged in teacher education in different ways. I teach a course and direct an associated practicum focused on learning. The course is part of a larger justice focused elementary teacher education program. Thomas teaches in and directs a program of pre-service teacher education. And Lonnie partners with a professional development organization to find ways to support experienced mathematics teachers in urban schools. So what we share is the view that designing responsible innovations in teacher education requires carefully attending to the goals, social relationships, and material dimensions of learning that are part of teacher education programs, university school partnerships, and classroom teachers' practices. So we are also all committed to organizing consequential learning for teachers, students, and communities that leverage their cultural and historical practices toward greater social justice. So today I'm gonna to share the analytic framework we developed for talking across the innovations that we've organized in our work and some of the questions that emerge from taking these particular perspectives. And like everyone else, I'm gonna do like a quick version of what our paper is about. I hope you will actually read the longer paper. So central to our analysis of innovations for teacher education is our emphasis on learning. We use the term consequential learning to describe how people organize their changing participation and those of others so as to be recognized as competent and valued participants in and across spatial, social, and temporal scales of practice. In studying learning, we are particularly attentive to how people manage issues of power, race, and cultural practices as they engage in joint activity, such as partnership work with each other. So the question with which all of us grappled as learning scientists and teacher educators is, how can we organize for consequential learning in teacher education? We approach this as a problem of collaborative or co-design, which means we needed to work with our partners, teachers, administrators, and teacher education faculty to identify what was not working in their specific context and then figure out which dimensions of social life we could change to, ad to advance our goals for justice. We did not think we could, quote, engineer our way out of injustice, but we did think that the metaphor of design could help us to be systematic in our approach to understanding the dialectic between social structures and local interactions. So from our view, changing what ways of knowing as a situated social practice or what ways of knowing are valued by whom, when, and where requires attention to what we call the knowledge, the infrastructure that constitutes knowledge. So that is the social and material organization of the world that supports definitions of what knowledge is and who can be a knower. So as a quick example of a complex idea of infrastructure, I want you to consider school curricula. So curricula, though varied, are often materially organized with the support of text, lecture points, and demonstrations to guide learners through content in a way that represents a progression of ideas and skills. 
and they are socially structured vis-a-vis -vis proposed participant structures and evaluation formats that are meant to orient learners to particular values and understandings of desired relationships between individuals in the world. So my point here is to point out that there are material and social dimensions of the infrastructure that I'm referring to, which is curricula. So attending to the material and social infrastructure of curricula can help you understand how they function to reproduce and or challenge power knowledge relations. And it can help you as a designer to know what you might leverage or revise to transform these outcomes. So focusing on the infrastructure that supported our teacher education designs or innovations gave us a way to engage in what Michael Cole and Peg Griffin have called remediating, re-hyphen mediating, or reorganizing the current and social and material dimensions of infrastructure to support valued knowledge practices. So our orientation towards remediating infrastructure is founded in the assumption that we can use theory to reflect on and organize action towards meaningful change in support of greater justice. So in the cases that we shared in our paper, we considered the different contexts of our teacher education work and interpreted our designs towards justice using an infrastructural lens. Our cases considered whose knowledge and goals were being valued through how our designs were concretely enacted and how changing who did what, where, with whom, and with which tools changed the nature of the kinds of situated knowledge and expertise that was valued. So doing this helped us see the mundane ways in which what was counted as knowledge and whose knowledge mattered in our specific context was so structured socially and materially. It helped us understand how knowledge infrastructures have been historically established and enacted to ignore and or devalue local forms of expertise. And it helped us to imagine new ways of coordinating and creating new forms of social and material infrastructure to support consequential learning for teachers, students, and school communities. So as an example from our paper, Thomas's interest in the politics of learning helped him see how the material arrangement of his teacher education program separated social foundations, that is the study of the social, historical, and political organization of schooling, how it separated social foundations from the psychological uh, foundations of learning, and how both of these were problematically separated from pre-service teachers' field experiences. So in and through these mundane, everyday arrangements and interactions, the two-world problem of university-based knowledge and school site-based knowledge or based practice, um, the seeming objectivity of theories of learning, and the notion of social change as an exclusively macro-level process, those practices were re-inscribed through the material and social organization of the program. He came to understand how this long-standing material and social organization of the program limited pre-service teachers' understandings of schooling, the relationship between theory and practice, and their roles within schools as agents for justice. Thomas wanted to figure out how to productively blur the boundaries between theory, field, and community. In conversation with organizers from an immigrant rights organization, they considered how they could co-design a strand within a teacher education program that worked toward these goals. goals. So working with a teacher who had a long-term relationship um, with the organization, they prioritized a co-learning context that would be mutually beneficial to the pre-service teachers and the high school students. So together, this team from the university, the community, and a local school imagined concrete ways to remediate the social and material dimensions of a strand within a program of teacher education in ways that were more responsible to the students, to prospective teachers, cooperating teachers, and communities. 
So in this case, the notion of who could be a teacher educator and where teacher education takes place was expanded. All right, it'd be nice if I had no pages on my numbers on my pages. Okay. There we go. So tensions are always part of any kind of design. So rather than ignoring them, the perspective on learning that we take as authors um, it leads us to acknowledge and dig into those tensions as part of the iterative process of redesign and adaptation. So building on the tensions that we have each experienced in our local context, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude with the fundamental set of questions that we feel need to be addressed throughout the co-design process. So the questions are, when does infrastructure need to be remediated and how do we know Based on whose perspectives are we making these judgments? Who needs to do this work? And finally, towards what ends are we working? And how do we know when we've gotten there? So teacher education for justice demands that we stay alert to how learning is materially and socially organized, to recognize and extend the assets of students, teachers, and communities and it also requires our ability to adapt our designs for teacher education in principled ways that further students' dignity and advance their agency. So I'm gonna end there. Thank you for putting up with this. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Mariana Soto Manning. I'm a professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. And today, recognizing the importance of learning from experience, I share with you a mixed method study where I critically problematize how teacher educators often position student teaching as pivotal in teacher education programs' inability to focus on racial equity, entitled toward practically just transformations interrupting racism in teacher education. So historically and contemporarily, the quality of student teaching placements in initial teacher education has been closely associated with the quality of teachers. The aim is not to work together to transform teaching or teacher education, but to select, to curate the best placements. And this is what they often look like. Seeking to ensure quality placements for their students, teacher education programs curate placements under the guise of partnerships, yet often without much collaboration. In the US, this historically sedimented practice often constructs quality student teaching placements as those serving mostly white students, perpetuating racist ideas in really problematic ways. Racialized quality student teaching placements contribute to the development of teachers who are unfamiliar with the pedagogies that build on the strengths of students of color, of communities and families from minoritized backgrounds, the growing demographic majority in the US. Seeking to interrupt justice and foster, seeking to interrupt injustice and foster justice through much needed transformations in teacher education. I hope to contribute to a pedagogical agenda for transformation, for transforming teacher education by considering how critical pedagogy really firmly rooted in commitments to fostering justice and equity can serve as an avenue for transforming teacher education. I critically problematize the argument that teacher education programs avoid placing student teachers in schools serving intersectionally minoritized students of color because they need quality student teaching placements, which are defined according to dominant norms. Further, I make visible how this argument serves to justify the reproduction of what Christie Slater has titled the overwhelming presence of whiteness in teacher education. 
Despite widely professed commitments to social justice, teacher education in the U.S. remains pervasively characterized by whiteness. Demographically, 82% of public school teachers and 74% of students in university-based teacher education programs are white. And so are 78% of teacher educators. This has huge ramifications for what happens in teacher education programs, including how curriculum is designed and what is taught. And this 78% includes all of our graduate students and those, peop those um, teacher educators who are actually preparing to go back to other countries and engage in teacher education there. So the professorial uh, percentage is actually much higher. In addition to the demographic whiteness, teacher education is characterized by white ways and systems of knowing which historically and contemporarily continue to further white interests through the invisibility and or the normalizing of systemic racism. So rejecting the way that teacher education is currently organized and seeking to interrupt its incredible whiteness, Ladson Billings identified three leverage points in 2017 for transforming teacher education. Admissions, which is widely talked about, we need to recruit more teachers of color, student teaching, which is actually not looked at very much, and certification, the gatekeeping structures such as EdTPA right now in the United States, but so many tests that have come prior since black teachers were pushed out of black schools in the South and then required to take white tests in order to regain their license to teach. So in this paper, I actually focus on student teaching placements because learning from experience is fundamental in the process of becoming a teacher. Placements are then a possible site for the problematization and transformation of teacher education, albeit one seldom interrogated with regard to teacher education's reproduction of racism. So seeking to interrupt whiteness as an often unquestioned yet racist architectural feature in the design of teacher education, I reject claims of neutrality in teacher education. Deliberately regarding teacher education as ideological, I approach the transformation of student teaching by addressing the need to centrally reposition communities of color. To do so, I engage in a national survey of U.S. university-based teacher educators to identify and problematize practices which have been taken for granted in teacher education, yet have contributed to the reproduction and or maintenance of the overwhelming whiteness which characterizes teacher education. The survey really sought to identify obstacles to teacher education programs focused on racial justice from the perspective of practicing teacher educators via descriptive analysis. I surveyed 83 teacher educators across the U.S. about their ideas and practices as they relate to justice and equity-focused teacher education. I was actually surprised that the most commonly identified obstacle to quality teacher education focusing on equity and justice was student teaching. 68.7% of the respondents identified student teaching as that unsurmountable obstacle. To better understand the issue, I followed up by interviewing eight teacher educators using video-enabled technology who had identified student teaching as the greatest obstacle to engaging in equity-focused teacher education. After the interviews, which lasted between 40 and 65 minutes, after they were transcribed, I used transcription as analytical method, seeking to highlight the data's emotional hot points and heighten language from the original discourse. This allowed me to identify what was important and critical to the teacher educators interviewed. Here are a couple of examples. We just don't have good placements that are diverse, and by diverse they really meant have serve children, families of color. Another one was, I have to choose. I either place them in a school with, in a good school or in a school serving minority kids. These were very much representative of the emotional hot points in follow-up interviews, and they were rooted in ideologies of pathology and furthered white supremacist aims. The interviews unveiled how racist ideas shaped the definition of quality in teacher education and quality student teaching placements. This aligned with the reasons I had heard in my own teacher education program 
for its own lack of student teaching placements prior in schools serving intersectionally minoritized students of color. So as a situated representation of an implicit yet pervasive racist practice, this issue needed to be addressed. So instead of identifying an issue and writing about it per the typical configuration of academic work, you know, we identify, we write about it, we publish, we move on, which often focus on the norms of individual achievement over collective well-being, I engaged in practical research characterized by reflection, dialogue, and action, leading to transformation, really informed by the work of Paulo Freire. Specifically, I problematized the generative theme identified by U.S. teacher educators via survey, the racist construction of student teaching in schools populated by intersectionally minoritized children of color as problems. I sought to collaborate with teachers to reorganize the learning environment of student teaching, developing a more robust learning experience for student teachers saturated with meaningful and authentic educational opportunities. I wanted to move away from theorizing justice and engage with justice as praxis. So I identify the public school close to the university, a school mostly serving students of color from low income background, and sought to work alongside teachers collaboratively to revision student teachers in a way that moved the experience away from its reproduction of whiteness. I started working with a teacher who's here today, Jessica Martel. Jessica, raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, so each week, Jessica and I met for three hours. Together, we negotiated the construction of a horizontally aligned collaborative partnership marked by intellectual interdependence. Our ideas were transformed dialogically over time, and there was the absence of a calcified expert, the university person. We really worked together. Um, and we negotiated this... Uh, this process, but today, I, instead of talking about the process that Jessica and I um, negotiated, which we actually wrote about in the piece that just came out in Teachers College Record, I'm going to share highlights of the development of a collective leading to the transformation of student teaching and how this work actually started with our partnership, with the partnership between Jessica and I, because I want to signal how authentic relationships and horizontally aligned partnerships take time. They, they're not a given. This learning community provided fertile grounds for the problematization and potential transformation of student teaching in ways that interrupted its inherent racism. As teachers in the school where Jessica taught watched our relationship grow, Jessica's classroom became a space for critical conversations about topics pertaining to race, racism, and injustice in and through education. Among these conversations, all of which were audio recorded and transcribed, the need to transform teacher education in general and student teaching in particular figured prominently. Five kindergarten teachers, one first grade teacher, three second grade teachers, and one fourth grade teacher came together regularly, at least weekly. Nine were teachers of color and one a white teacher who clearly identified and acted as an ally. Regarding this as a quality space for the development of teachers where quality was epistemologically centered on minoritized communities, I placed Idalia, a Latina initial teacher certification student in Jessica's classroom. Idalia joined the collective during her student teaching semester. This group of teachers really relished the opportunity to critically read their worlds, centering the perspectives of women of color, positioning themselves agentively, and developing a professional collective committed to transformation. While they initially engaged in critically reading their worlds with great ease, with regard to their role in mentoring student teachers, this teacher collective felt stuck. What do we do, one of them asked, explaining, if we don't do anything, we're complicit, you know? So I shared with them this structure of Freudian culture circles as one possible way of moving from critical conversation to action as a situated representation of a critical adult education pedagogy. Culture circles really stood in stark contrast to most of their professional developments. It started really from the thematic investigation of their realities, reading their world, went through the identification of pressing and oppressing issues as important generative themes. Together, we problem posed, we dialogued, we engaged in problem solving, and we plotted and enacted transformative actions. Through culture circles, they read their worlds through thematic investigations. 
Some generative themes related to the student teaching identified through the data as the most no hot points were student teaching, student teachers having deficit perceptions of teachers of color, of children of color. One of them said they think those poor children, pobrecitos, and even when they mean well, they think the children are broken. The second theme was white university-based supervisors supporting student teachers' deficit perceptions through guidance and feedback. And here's a quote, instead of helping them, the student teachers understand how indirect language is not always, in, it's not always appropriate, they reinforce the would you like to conventions without acknowledging that not all families talk the white way, you know? And the third emotional hot point was that classrooms are seen by universities as a site for theoretical application under the assumption that university-based teacher educators know more and can determine what counts as valuable practice. Here's one of the things that they said. They see our, our classrooms as laboratories without thinking about our responsibility to children. After identifying these and other themes, the teacher collective problematized the historical, structure, and systemic roots of these generative themes. They regarded each other as valuable resources and engaged in critical dialogue, moving from reflection to action. They worked together to engage in actions that interrupted pre-service teachers' deficit perceptions. Oh, sorry, obviously I'm going the wrong way. You all have been very generous. <laughs> Um, they worked together to engage in actions that interrupted pre-service teachers' deficit perceptions, agentively reframing their classrooms as sites for transforming teacher education one student teacher at a time. Using transcription as an analytical method, I worked with them to identify what was critical to this group of teachers. How the purported fragmentation, which characterizes teacher education explained by Britzman, serves to keep a racist and whiteified status quo in place, and how teacher education is implicated in the reproduction of racism through its enactment of white superiority in content, demographics, and programmatic structures. In addition to identifying those two critical issues, this teacher collective problematized issues within the context of culture circles and sought to identify possible transformative actions to dismantle teacher educations and specifically student teaching's role in the reproduction of racism. As they developed over the course of an academic year, culture circles became intergenerational spaces where pre-service and in-service teachers and teacher educators learned together and unlearned as well. This space was marked by collective agency becoming sites for change. As a collective with distributed agency, they moved from seeing teaching as an individual endeavor to teaching as a collective responsibility. As Ellis and McNichol explained, they develop agency, the capacity and the freedom for human beings to act responsibly in widely distributed ways marked by trust, which led to confidence in their capacities to innovate. It's the wrong way. As reported in much more detail than this article, and there were some copies in the back, but it's also available online, within one year, the school became a hub for student teaching placements, often being requested by student teachers and being constantly referred to by other faculty as a good placement. The student population in the school did not change, nor did the teachers. But there was a new collaborative ethos, a distributed agency among teachers, teacher educators, and student teachers. So, in problematizing the lack of good placements as obstacles to equity and justice in teacher education, it is essential to understand the need to transform, to identify and transform racist structures, locations, and roles which have traditionally configured the work of teacher education, collectively and critically with teachers, pre-service and in-service. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers who amazingly all kept to time. I didn't actually get round to my stop card with any of them. Uh, but I hope what you've heard today uh, within these six speakers is these different layers of innovation and different ways of looking at it that actually has uh, stimulated your thinking in this area. And to help us further with that, 
uh, our discussant today, uh, Dorinda uh, Carter-Andrews, is going to take us through some of her thoughts that will take those ideas further. Thank you, Dorinda. Thank you very much, and thank you for staying to hear from our fabulous uh, presenters. I'm just so thankful to have had the pleasure to read this collection of papers, and I really encourage all of you um, to check the papers out in the Journal of Education for Teaching. I think they're available online, not in print yet. They are in print. So um, there are just so many um, rich insights and nuances here. And so I know for myself personally, there's a lot that I have to go back and even incorporate into my undergraduate and graduate courses. So just thank you for um, your, your insights and wisdom. So I'm going to try to um, pull together what we've heard here and some of the themes as I read the, the, the full papers in their entirety. And I want to start by saying um, I think Dr. Dominguez's paper provides a nice overview of the challenges we face in really innovating in teacher education and that being the need to make epistemological and ontological shifts in our pedagogy, practice, and praxis. And I really want to encourage us today to think about this. I don't think we talk about epistemology and ontology enough in ways that are really nuanced and meaningful in teacher education that move us to what he talks about as this decolonializing in teacher education. We do know teacher education is a political project, and as we've heard from our presenters today, there is a lot of rhetoric around social justice pedagogy and practice, but very little transformative practice and praxis. Bridging theory and practice matter. And so what does this look like when it's done well? I think these papers move us to ask and attend to critical questions of program design that center humanization as an imperative. Humanization as an imperative and a move away from technocratic ideas about teaching and learning. We heard centering humanizing data as evidence and for me that really illuminated as Dr. Um, Turvey talked about in his paper, the role of narrative and how if we are really concerned with, as Dr. Dominguez said, really lifting up and being attentive to epistemologies and ontologies of the global south, we know that narrative and truth telling are essential and foundational in those communities. And so what does it look like when partnerships really matter in the ways that the Juro, Horn, and Philip paper talk about that also lift up epistemological and ontological indigeneity? We have to consider what's necessary across knowledge domains when we're looking to make these shifts and establish authentic partnerships that move us to transformative innovation. I also read across the papers this idea of how conceptions of quality are really pitted against considering the needs of intersectionally minoritized youth and communities. And we see that emerge in Dr. Soto Manning's paper specifically. And I like that the Burnett and Lampert paper, as well as the Juro and All paper, offer us concrete examples of how our epistemological and ontological shifts get enacted for centering equity and justice. A unique feature of this collection of papers is that they really ask us to consider how can we promote innovation in teacher education that creates new ideas that have public value for the whole of society. 
and not just focus on increased productivity and lower costs or even greater mobility within existing social structures. These papers purport or argue humanization broadly as an imperative for innovation and really help us resist what Turvey refers to as pedagogical paralysis. In the absence of a humanizing imperative for innovation in teacher education, a technologically driven development such as learning analytics heralds a new hyper-economistic paradigm that really further dehumanizes the practices of learning, teaching, and this process of becoming that uh, some of you in the room have heard me talk about uh, in my own work around humanizing pedagogy in teacher education. And so with the time I have left, I will make a few specific comments about each of the individual papers that I hope also raise additional questions for us to think about. I appreciate in Goodwin and Goodwin's and Darity's paper that they really focus on what do teacher educators need to know and do in order to move from espousing to enacting social justice in their own teacher, teacher education practice? And through this focus on the five knowledge domains, I think we can think about those frames, not just for teacher educators, but for our work with pre-service teachers and also thinking about these epistemological and ontological shifts. So what does it mean to authentically focus on the personal, contextual, pedagogical, sociological, and social across all domains of our work in teacher education. It is possible for teacher educators to embrace the goal of teaching for social justice in the absence of shared meaning. And so this focus on knowledge domains for teacher educators is an innovation in and of itself given the paucity of research on teacher educator qualifications and formal preparation of those of us who prepare teachers. Given the findings from this work, I believe there are implications for redesigning teacher preparation curriculum such that knowledge gaps for future teacher educators are less apparent. We actually need real innovation in how we prepare future teacher educators. And I think the Goodwin and Darity paper move us in a way to have some framework for doing that. Dr. Turvey's paper really focuses on humanizing as an innovation. And this question, the, the article argues for humanization of research evidence through narrative as an urgent project in teacher education. I believe this really moves, uh, uh, challenges us to move away from discourses, as he says, of econom econometrics, because this flies directly in the face of affirming, sustaining, and empowering communities and historically marginalized students. So a question that his paper raises for us is how can our discourse be less categorical and technocratic and more responsive to lived experiences and epistemological and ontological frameworks that emanate from the communities we claim to serve. Discourse matters and narrative is essential for establishing care, dignity, and dialogic consciousness raising that we often claim to promote, particularly in teacher preparation programs that have a social justice focus. I appreciate that Dr. Turvey offers narrative as a humanizing innovation in teacher education, suggesting that humanizing research evidence can address the per persistent issues of social justice and inequity. Because narrative is an intrinsically human 
interpretive and explanatory device. And again, if we are committed to really honoring the lived experiences of those who have been historically and traditionally marginalized in our school spaces globally, then we will take up narrative and voice as data that informs our program design and implementation. This reminds me of Brian Brayboy's work about stories as data. And as uh, Turvey talks about in his paper, the ways in which teachers need to be worthy witnesses, which is offered up by Paris and Wynn. It also um, uh, reminds me of a connection to William's notion of radical honesty that in our work as teacher educators, how can we engage in a process of humanization that allows for truth telling with our students and amongst ourselves, that values narrative and personal experience, and then moves us to action. And this in, its, in and of itself is part of the process of becoming as teachers and teacher educators. I want to say a little bit more about the Dominguez paper in terms of the idea of rethinking justice projects in teacher education because, he, as he says, our discourses may have become shallow since they don't often honor the lived, material, and effective realities of historically marginalized communities. We saw this question uh, on one of his PowerPoint slides, but I'd like for us to think about it again as we think about these epistemological and ontological shifts. If we are not centering global South thinking, epistemologies, and ontological frameworks in our own thought, work, writing, and praxis, how can we expect novice teachers to do the same? So in fact, we must not just talk the talk as teacher educators, we have to walk it out. As, Paolo, uh, as, as, as those who are inspired by Freire have said, we make this road by walking. And in part, uh, one of the things that Dominguez's paper raises for me is an alignment with my own argument around the need to make epistemological and ontological shifts through resisting binaries and utilizing multimodality as foundational to humanizing pedagogy and teacher education. We have to become comfortable with what Dominguez calls epistemic discomfort. And I would urge us to think about this is not an easy process and will not happen overnight. It will require that we actually reimagine and re-envision the way we have done teacher education historically and even in contemporary times. In this work to embrace epistemic discomfort, we actually resist what I call damage-centered pedagogical work. And the implications for what Dominguez offers is a concrete discourse example, as we saw here in his presentation, for how this might play out in classrooms. I would argue that we need more examples of what this looks like in practice, and that there are those of us in the room who may already be engaging in the pedagogical imaginary as a radical innovation, and we need to write about that so that we have those examples. With regard to the Giraud, excuse me, Giraud, Horn, and Phillip paper, I appreciate their call to all of us to have shared commitments to consequential learning that leverages cultural and historical resources towards justice, and this focus on the re-mediating of infrastructures in teacher education. How this process of remediating knowledge infrastructures really can become a site for innovation in teacher development. I really appreciate the way in which uh, the authors frame this as restructuring social and material dimensions of infrastructure. And if you read the paper, you really get some nice examples around three cases that they offer of what this looks like. 
This raises the question of, uh, that I think they also pose, how do we authentically value local forms of knowledge and expertise? This is a fundamental question that should be responded to across teacher education programs. And what does it mean to authentically collaborate when you attend to the organization of infrastructure? Because in this process, new forms of valued knowledge and expertise can be generated. The questions that Dr. Giroux raised at the end of her presentation, I believe are essential for considering how learning is materially and socially organized in ways that are principled and, and advance justice goals. And then finally, Dr. Soto Manning's paper really takes on this work of how we racialize quality in teacher education. And I don't think we talk about that explicitly enough. And I really appreciate the case example in her paper of how this happens through the student teaching placement, which we know as a field, we need more research about what actually happens in the student teaching placement. So I would encourage us to consider how the racialization of field placements more broadly pitfall us into an acting damage-centered pedagogy. Because think about this, even when we flip our definition of quality, for those of us who work in explicitly named social justice-oriented programs, and we place those students in urban centers, right, assuming that placing students in historically minoritized communities will help raise their critical consciousness, we actually have not done the hard decolonial work that Dr. Dominguez suggests, which fosters an experience where student teachers really can enact in epistemic disobedience, as he says, and co-construct with teachers and students and communities to really decolonize their learning experiences as pre-service teachers. So I challenge all of us to really ask ourselves how the concept of quality, as Dr. Soto Manning raises, cloaks the reproduction of racism in and through teacher education. How is teacher education and how might you be implicated in the reproduction of racial inequities? Because when you are implicated in that work, it inhibits you from being able to be innovative in transformative teacher education projects. We know from this paper that student teaching is a site where whiteness is upheld under the guise of notions of quality that mask white power and privilege. But a, a nuance and a way forward that Dr. Soto Manning offers us is practically just work. And I find this concept to be very important to the work of decolonizing teacher education and helping us make those epistemological and ontological shifts. And culture circles can be a way to do that, as she talks about in her paper. So in closing, I see this collection of six papers as offering us much to think about by way of innovation in teacher education. But if we are not willing to do the hard work of thinking about whose knowledge count, counts, whose body counts, and the ways in which we are willing to collaborate and partner in meaningful and authentic ways, we will not really be able to move beyond talking the talk of social justice teacher education and walking it out. Thank you. So I want to thank you all today uh, for coming along to um, th this event. Um, wh what you've seen today has been the culmination of uh, work that started just under two years ago um, at this meeting uh, in London where the Centre for Innovation in Teacher Education Development 
uh, called together uh, scholars uh, from across the world to come and talk about reclaiming innovation. And you've seen the different ways that the different papers have uh, added to our understanding and knowledge of this, but also raised questions and made us start to possibly rethink how we take these ideas forward. It's extremely rewarding to see that uh, a special issue uh, arose from that meeting uh, just under two years ago. And to also see people here, a very good audience here today, early uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, come along to hear about it, but also hopefully to discuss and take that further. Uh, I particularly want to thank our discussant, uh, Dorinda Carter-Andrews, I think did a really amazing job uh, of pulling together the themes that are in there. Uh, but I would encourage you also to go back to the original papers and have a look for yourself because uh, I think that will stimulate uh, your own uh, ideas about how this may move forward and how we might, may take teacher education in a more socially justice way forward um, as our ideas do develop. So I'm uh, going to stop at this point. Uh, I'd either going to ask you to talk to people, other people before the end. We've got about five minutes before we need to leave the room. Or to come forward and talk to some of the authors of the papers uh, about your thoughts and comments of what you've heard today. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.